Let's take a moment to overview the key theologians during the patristic period. Uh, again, Justin Martyr was from 100 to 165, and he's one of the greatest Christian apologists writing against paganism. He provided history with an early example of a theologian who attempted to relate the gospel to the outlook of Greek philosophy. Irenaeus of Lyons, uh, he was from 130 to 200, probably a native of Asia Minor, who was elected bishop of the southern French city of Lyons around 178. He's chiefly noted for his major writing against the heresies that defended the Christian faith against Gnosticism. Clement of Alexandria, from 115 to 215, he was a leading Alexandrian writer with a concern to explore the relationship between Christian thought and Greek philosophy. Tertullian, 160 to 255, was a major figure in early Latin theology who produced a series of significant controversial and apologetic writings. He is noted for his ability to coin new Latin terms to translate the emerging theological vocabulary of the Greek-speaking Eastern Church. Origen, from 185 to 254, was a leading representative of the Alexandrian School of Theology, especially noted for his allegorical exposition of Scripture and his use of Platonic ideas in theology, particularly in his Christology. The originals of many of his works, which were written in Greek, have been lost, with the result that some are known only in Latin translations of questionable reliability. Cyprian of Carthage, we're not sure exactly when he was born, but he did die in 258. He was a Roman rhetorician of considerable skill, who was converted to Christianity around 246 and elected Bishop of North Africa uh, in the city of Carthage in 248. He was martyred in that city in 258. His writings uh, focus primarily on the unity of the church and the role of its bishops in maintaining orthodoxy and order. Athanasius, 296 to 373, was one of the most significant defenders of orthodox Christology during the period of the Arian controversy. He was elected as Bishop of Alexandria in 328. He was deposed on account of his opposition to Arianism, although he was widely supported in the West. His views were only finally recognized at the Council of Constantinople in 381 after his death. Gregory of Nazianzus, 329 to 389, also known as Gregory Nazianzen, is remembered for his five theological orations written around 380, and a compilation of extracts from the writings of origin called the Philokalia. He also wrote defensively on the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. Basil of Caesarea, 330 to 379, also known as Basil the Great, was based in Cappadocia in modern Turkey. He is remembered for his writings on the Trinity, especially the distinctive role of the Holy Spirit. He was elected bishop in Caesarea in 370. Gregory of Nyssa, 330 to 395, one of the Cappadocian fathers, is especially noted for his rigorous defense of the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation during the 4th century. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780 780- Four five zero thirty seven thirty by fax at seven eight zero four six eight ten ninety six or by mail at forty seven ten dash thirty seven A Avenue Edmonton that's E D M O N T O N Alberta abbreviated capital A capital B Canada T six L three T five you may also request a free printed catalog and remember that John Calvin in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, 
God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle is adopted by the papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.